Paleontology sucks a little sometimes, because of just how generally awful the fossil record is. By that, I mean that the fossil record has a bias, and only a fraction of all life that has ever lived, or died for that matter, has become fossilized and survived the millions of years as a fossil for us to find them. That being said, the fossil record is still far better than one might suspect. So, most of the time, extinct taxa are known from only one specimen. Another is never found ever again. However, there are a few that have continued to crop up in various rock layers as more and more work is done on those layers. The giant dinosaurs were no exception, and there are now over a handful of individual specimens known from several dinosaur genera, and even species. Diplodocus, Apatosaurus, Allosaurus, Stegosaurus, Pachyrhinosaurus, Edmontosaurus, and many more are known from so many specimens that growth stages, sexual dimorphism, individual variation, pathology, and much more can be understood or entirely solved. Two of my favorite examples of this sort of cosmic luck are Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops. The more specimens of a given tax are found, the better the nicknames need to be. You can't have five T-Rexes named Sue, right? Unfortunately for Triceratops, they often don't get super cool edgy names to tickle my sense of search engine optimization. The only thing left in many specimens are chunks of the skull or just bits and pieces from various parts of the body. No single Triceratops or Tyrannosaurus has ever been found 100% complete, and that may be practically impossible for any fossil anyway, given the pressures of natural forces. That being said, some have been found that are very close to the 100% mark. Everyone knows Sue, they are nearly 90% complete, but what about Triceratops? Well, it seems that in the nearly 140 years since the discovery of the first specimen, none have been as complete as Sue is. That was until one outstanding specimen was uncovered by commercial fossil hunter Craig Feister out in the Badlands of Montana in 2014. Feister was prospecting on private land when he came upon a sandstone ridge and large wet sinkhole that revealed a giant triceratops back end eroding from the outcrop. It took Feister and his company over a year to fully excavate and field prepare the bones and take them back to his prep lab for further preparation. That preparation would actually eventually be done on Vancouver Island, Victoria, BC at Dino Lab Incorporated, a privately owned company that does fossil excavation, preparation, fossil wholesaling, fossil restoration, museum fabrication, molding, and casting. They are world renowned and do some great work, including the story behind Victoria the T-Rex, a story I'll save for another time. So, ironically, the Triceratops would be prepared in Victoria, and then the Museum's Victoria Association from Victoria, Australia would spend two years negotiating a deal to buy the specimen and bring it to their museum. You see, fossil laws are silly, arbitrary, and completely different depending on where the fossil was found. In the US, where the Triceratops was found, there are basically no laws if the fossil is found on private land. Anything found on private land can be sold off to anyone. This is not the case in many other, perhaps more civilized countries like in Mongolia and Brazil, where fossils belong to the state for all citizens to enjoy or study. Museums Victoria has a whole long legal process they go through to make sure anything they buy is from a reputable source. This makes a little bit more sense with what other types of objects Museums Victoria deals in archaeological and historical artifacts. These sorts of things have more direct connection to people, their history, and their culture. Plus, Australia is made up of communities of natives and immigrants, resulting in recent efforts to do things as ethically as possible, to greater or lesser extent. That's as political as I dare to get right now, though. Anyway, the actual specimen is incredible. It's easily one of the most important dinosaur fossils ever found, and is objectively the most important Triceratops fossil ever found. Once the remains were brought to Melbourne in eight car-sized 50-kilogram crates, the team at the Melbourne Museum began the process of cataloging and digitizing everything. 
They scanned every single bone and made everything publicly available to anyone who wants to study the critter, which the museum nicknamed Horridus. It's a cool name, but thanks guys for making it extremely difficult to research. All I get are results for the Triceratops Horridus species. Once it arrived to the museum, they ascensioned Hordus as specimen NMV P256878. I stated that Hordus is probably the most important Triceratops specimen ever found, and that is due to its completeness, which has been estimated to be 85%. All in all, about 267 bones were recovered from an individual that was found articulated in situ. This means all of the skeleton's bones were arranged as they were when the animal died, which is very rare. The thing was only missing some bits of the feet and underside of the tail. The skull is 98% complete and weighs in at 570 pounds, or 261 kilograms, with a frill that stretches 4.9 feet, 1.5 meters, behind the skull. Let's bring in Mr. Man from Animal Planet's The Most Extreme. Real quick to get a sense of scale. Hortus is estimated to be 6 to 7 meters or 19.6 to 22.9 feet long and 2 meters or 6.5 feet tall. This means it is near the largest these things got, but is not the largest ever known, which was as much as 9 meters or 30 feet in length. The museum website on Horridus states that adult Triceratops could weigh in as much as 6 to 12 tons, but does not provide an estimate for Horridus specifically. But since it was not the very biggest ever found, you can sort of guesstimate its weight at the middle of the weight range. Thanks, Mr. Man. Horridus's completeness isn't just important for the sake of it either. Melbourne Museum's collection manager of vertebrate paleontology, Tim Ziegler, told New Atlas, This skeleton uniquely preserves parts of this animal that don't survive so well in the fossil record. In this case, we'd got things as precious as the entire tail of the animal for the first time. To know how long that stretches out, see the very last vertebra unequivocally, small enough to sit in the palm of your hand. Yeah, so, because no other Triceratops specimen has ever been found as complete as Hortus, some parts of Hortus can now be used as a measuring stick to compare all other Triceratops specimens against. The gifts keep on coming with Hortus, as another incredibly important aspect of the find is the preservation of soft tissues. When the preparation team removed some of the rock around Hordus's foot, they found what appeared to be a hexagonally patterned skin impression on the toe. Tim Ziegler stated, Rather than an impression left behind by a handprint, that's the last trace of the soft tissues of the animal. It's the organic remains of its skin underneath its last little finger. This skin has most likely been replaced by minerals or has undergone the very rare process of iron replacement as seen in some blood cells preserved in Edmontosaurus and Tyrannosaurus fossils. For clarification, none of this means that the actual original organic carbon material has been preserved. No DNA, sadly. Horridus also had some of the tendons along its back preserved. In life, some tendons can become hardened like bone, thus the moniker of ossified tendons. This lends the tendons to fossilization. Horridus also happened to be preserved in three dimensions, which is rare. Many fossils are squashed or stretched due to the slow movement of the rocks that contain the fossils. Because of this level of preservation, the Australian team was able to scan the inside of the skull to get an accurate 3D computer model of Horridus's brain. Or technically, what is called an endocast. The cast of the brain and associated soft bits made by the mold of the brain case. This didn't provide a ton of mind-blowing new information, as it was just more evidence that Triceratops had a reptile-like brain that was long and cylindrical in shape. However, the endocast did preserve the inner ear, which told the Australians that Triceratops could hear in the low frequency range, picking up the heavy footfalls of other giant dinosaurs, something especially useful for a priitum of Tyrannosaurus. Perhaps this hearing range would have allowed dinosaurs like Horridus to communicate with other members of its species over long distances like elephants do today. 
The semicircular canals of the inner ear provided data on how Triceratops held itself as it moved. If you need to keep balance, and you have a neutral position in which an animal is most comfortable, then the direction and shape of those canals will reflect that resting posture," Ziegler stated to New Atlas. This information went into the skeletal mount of the specimen in the Melbourne Museum. What we have is a realistic and really dynamic pose. I think to have it in this stepping posture, moving through, lifting its toes off the ground, splaying them out, and putting weight on other limbs, this kind of evocation of the animal while it was alive is a way to really honor this individual and pay respect to it," Ziegler stated. Based on the radiometric dating of the rock layers from which Hordus was extracted, it would have been trampling about the badlands of Montana about 67 million years ago, in the latest Cretaceous, one million years before the apocalypse. At this time, the region was lush with swamps, wetlands, and deltas. Only a special circumstance would have allowed as big a beast as Hordus to be as perfectly preserved as it was. This Triceratops was preserved in an ancient river channel, now part of the Hell Creek Formation, in the late Cretaceous in Montana, Ziegler says, and that's a river channel that most of the time is fairly quiet. But what we see surrounding this specimen in situ was an undifferentiated massive sand body. That's indicative of a pulse of water and a pulse of sediment that must have covered this animal relatively soon after it had died, and certainly before it was, say, scavenged by predators. The excavation crew took a ton of photos of the dig site as they were excavating so that they could use photogrammetry to reconstruct the whole thing in 3D in the computer. This allows researchers to investigate the site even from thousands of miles away. This data showed the Australian team that Hordus died in a resting posture rather than pulled apart by currents or scavengers. As Ziegler says, that was so evocative because you saw that it was not scattered bones down a riverbed. It's not abstracted in the way that a disarticulated skeleton might be, but instead it was like this poor old beast had just laid down and gone to sleep. No scientific papers have yet been published on or using Hordus, but considering the nature of the specimen and how useful it will be to the future study of Triceratops, I am sure many will be forthcoming. Hordus is the star attraction of an entire elaborate exhibit at the Melbourne Museum, but it's not the only thing there. The entire Hell Creek world has been recreated in various mediums. Animated caricatures of the animals Hordus lived with beckon you in to the exhibit, and many fossil bits and pieces of them are exhibited in displays throughout the exhibit. Ankylosaurus, Denversaurus, Thessalosaurus, Achiroraptor, Pachycephalosaurus, Edmontosaurus, and Tyrannosaurus are all represented. You'll notice that a lot of these fossils are much less impressive than the main event, and that just serves to underline how incredibly rare finding an amazingly complete, wonderfully preserved, single individual dinosaur is. By taking all of these fossils together, we can get an idea of the diversity of animals that existed at the time," said Hazel Richards, curatorial research assistant of paleontology at Melbourne Museum. Exhibition producer Maggie Watson stated, It's about creating that visitor journey, so we really wanted to set up some anticipation before you meet the actual Triceratops. We wanted to transport visitors to the place of Montana, where the fossil comes from, and invite people to step back in time into that Cretaceous world. Have you seen Horridus yet? It will be at the Melbourne Museum, ideally forever, so no rush. Can't wait to see what science it will be used in. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.